For government spending to have any stimulative effect at all, and thus to avoid perfect crowding out, government has to actually be able to channel those additional dollars that it's spending into those specific parts of the economy where there are idle resources, assuming that any exist. The difficulty is that when you're closer to the perfect crowding out scenario, as I think we are, than you are to the scenario in which government spending willy-nilly is likely to generate effects, it becomes very difficult for government spending to do that, especially in light of political processes that determine alternatively how the resources might be channeled. So the question is, how is government actually be going to be able to get the resources to those areas of the economy where there are idle resources and thus there actually could be a stimulative impact? I think the key to finding solutions to the current economic crisis first lies in understanding what caused the crisis in the first place, the source of the problem, and that was government intervention, partly in the form of the Federal Reserve artificially lowering, it, lowering interest rates, and partly in the form of government encouraging these additional people to get into houses who in fact didn't belong in houses. Once we recognize that, we should become far more skeptical about government intervention into the economy in the first place. Now, one way, one thing that's good for the economy, uh, which is good for the economy in all times, and, and therefore suggests policies that we should adopt, not only in regular economic times, but also in crisis, would be things that in general encourage productivity and encourage wealth creation, which includes cutting capital gains taxes, for example, and in fact cutting all sorts of taxes, as well as cutting many forms of wasteful government spending, which is exactly the opposite tact uh, from that we're pursuing at the moment. The basic idea behind the Austrian business cycle theory is that the Federal Reserve artificially lowers interest rates, causing businesses to take on what eventually proved to be unprofitable loans. Businesses are happy to take on those loans because they think they're profitable when the interest rate is low. But that artificially low interest rate can't be sustained. Eventually it has to pop back up. And when it does, the investments that were undertaken by those businesses eventually prove to become unprofitable. That's the bust phase, which corresponds with the boom phase when they're undertaking the additional investment. You can see something very similar to this kind of a pattern happening related to today's crisis in the following way. The Federal Reserve for several years was creating artificially cheap credit. That cheap credit seems to have managed to channel its way into the housing industry in large part, with lots of additional consumers taking on additional debt in the form of mortgages. People taking on mortgages that wouldn't have normally at higher interest rates, for example. Eventually, the seeds of that boom period were sown in the form of a bust that we're experiencing now, where it turns out those people couldn't in fact afford those homes. The common claim that capitalism caused the crisis is flat out a myth. What markets do, or market participants do, is respond to the incentives that they face. If government pays somebody, or if government subsidizes somebody, to engage in what ultimately proves to be an unprofitable and economically destructive behavior, guess what? Market participants will engage in those behaviors. So when, for example, Congress encouraged people to get into homes who didn't belong in those homes, guess what? Those people got into homes. Ultimately, that proved to be a failure. Similarly, when the Federal Reserve artificially depresses interest rates, that encourages businesses to take on loans that, in fact, they shouldn't have taken on. So all that we have happening in the current crisis is markets responding rationally to the incentives that government creates. If you want to find out where the crisis ultimately lies, at who's to blame, we need to look at the policies that government had in place. And when we do that, I think it becomes fairly clear that markets aren't to blame, government is. The thing about government debt is that ultimately somebody has to repay it. And in the case of America, that somebody is the American taxpayer. So at the very least, what we need to think about as we accumulate this massive debt is ultimately how is this going to impact the private sector's ability to generate future wealth down the road. If we create lots of debt now, it may very well create a situation in which the market, even once we're in better times, is less able to do the very things that we want it to do. Just because government wants to do something doesn't necessarily mean that government can. And unfortunately, government's inability to achieve its goals is oftentimes the result of government itself. I think that we can see this most clearly, for example, with the current economic crisis, when we look at what happened in Congress with respect to all the government spending that was supposed to be used in order to stimulate the economy, to employ idle resources that wouldn't be employed because of supposedly failing market forces. In fact, what we observe is government spending sprees on all sorts of things that are completely unrelated to economic recovery, and in fact are unlikely, therefore, to stimulate the economy at all. My new book, entitled The Invisible Hook, The Hidden Economics of Pirates, which is being published by Princeton University Press, should actually come out in just a few weeks. And the basic idea of the book is to use very straightforward, basic economic principles and use them to help us better understand and explain infamous pirate behaviors. The basic idea of the book is that rather than thinking about pirates as somehow exceptional individuals who are inherently different from normal individuals, uh, individuals who are somehow crazy and sadistic naturally, 
What I want to do in the book is instead to analyze them as rational profit seekers, to look at pirates as businessmen, which in fact I think, and I argue in the book, is really what they were. Using that basic economic lens, what I do then is explain pirates' behavior using rational choice theory. So for example, I consider the pirates' infamous flag, the, the Jolly Roger, a flag of skull and bones, and discuss it as a signaling device that pirates used to enhance their profitability when taking prey. I also consider uh, what I explore as the myth of pirate conscription, the idea that pirates universally enslaved their crew members and recruited them this way. Um, and instead, I consider the economic motivations behind why it didn't make sense for pirates to do that, but by the same token, why it did make sense in many cases for pirates to present an image of themselves as, as uh, rogues who in fact conscripted their members. I also consider pirate racial tolerance in the book, and I look at pirates' governance system, um, including their system of constitutional democracy. I think the most important takeaway from the book is what I call the effectiveness of self-governance. Pirates were outlaws and therefore couldn't rely on government to facilitate social cooperation between them. But if pirates couldn't socially cooperate with one another, if in fact there was no honor among thieves, then there was no way that they could combine for mutual benefit in plundering merchant ships. What in fact pirates did to overcome this problem was privately develop a system of constitutional democracy that in fact predated the adoption of constitutional democracy even in the United States. And I argue in the book there may be some reasons to think in important ways even predated uh, the English Bill of Rights in, in many respects. So pirates adopted this system and it provided a system of self-governance that enabled pirates to facilitate profitability and to enhance their ability to cooperate with one another.